You may not want a freight train rolling through your house unless it's this one. Hello, I'm Michael Holligan. Welcome to your new house. Imagine having a miniature train run through your new house on an overhead track. Teresa Garrett puts the fun into working on the railroad. Plus, water and carpet don't mix, especially in the bathroom. Super handyman Al Carroll makes a change for the better with tile. And speaking of tile, if it's time to step up the look of your outdoor pathway, Joe Sharinsky shows you how a few household tiles can make a big difference in a one-of-a-kind garden. All this and more right now on Your New House. Do you feel as safe in your home today as you did 10 years ago? Probably not. Whether you live in a city or the suburbs, the presence of crime has become an inescapable reality. For the safety of you and your family, you should have a monitored security system inside your home. But as thieves become more sophisticated over time, they're learning how to get around some security systems, especially ones that are hardwired into your home with a telephone line. They go out back and clip the line. I'll show you where. Now right here is a sign that tells all thieves, dig here, because right below here, that's where our phone lines are for all the homes up and down this alley. So if they dig down right below this sign, your shovel hits wires, all they gotta do is go ahead and cut through those wires with the shovel. They disable all the phone service up and down the road here. With no phone service, the security system cannot call in to the monitoring station, so no police are gonna be on the way if someone breaks in your house. Now explain to me how it works. I understand how a cell phone works, but how does a cellular security system actually work? The cellular security system is dependent upon the same technology that enables you to make a cellular phone call from anywhere. Uh, in this particular home, we've installed a cellular transmitter in the attic. So if anyone ever breaks into the house, the signal's gonna go to that and go to the police department or the monitoring station actually, instead of going along a conventional telephone wire? Exactly, so the possibility that someone could compromise the system by cutting the wires is now obsolete. And then how about over here? I notice you've got a different type of key fob and also a remote. What does this do, actually? This particular wireless remote enables you to turn the system on or off without actually going to the keypad by simply depressing this button. Okay. This system is now armed, and you'll see this particular device has confirmed that to you. You can do this from your driveway. You can do this from the yard. Upon return, you simply hit the button marked off and depress it and hold it for a minute and the system is now confirmed as being turned off and you'll see this light has turned on Okay. and you're ready to walk in. So when you first pull up in your car you just hit that instead of coming inside with hands full of stuff and trying to hit the keypad? That's right, that's right. Okay. It solves that problem. As well, this particular system has been equipped with a telephone module. From a cellular phone or a cordless phone like you have here in this particular house, you can dial the system and the system will voice prompt you through turn on and turn off statuses of the system. I like that. I like that a lot. How about things like the smoke detector? How do they work? Also wireless. It's as well, uh, it's programmed to detect the presence of smoke. We have a wireless motion detector. We have a wireless glass break detector in this house. Okay, now I heard you have something a little special where we can see what's going on in the other rooms as well? Yes, we do. Okay, let's go take a look at that. Well, Tom, are you sure this is it? Because it looks like a motion detector to me. Well, that's how we designed it, Michael. It's actually a camera. And why a hidden camera? This enables a homeowner to look in privately to the goings-on in their home. Maybe a babysitter's here, perhaps somebody home repair type uh, craftsman. Yeah, making sure they're doing the work? Exactly. All right. Well, where do you look at the picture itself? On a laptop or a PC, equipped with a modem and software. You got one here? We do. Let's go take a look. Tom, I like the way that it looks inside a home office. It looks ordinary. It doesn't look like part of a hidden camera setup, does it? No, it doesn't. The CPU here is what enables all of this technology to work. The CPU actually benefits from a dedicated telephone line, which is how the laptop is connected to the CPU through ordinary voice grade telephone lines. In this picture, what we see is the homeowner cleaning the house, and that all comes from the imagery that's being reflected by the camera that we looked at in the living room a little earlier. That's really a clear picture. Yes, it is. We could actually, Michael, have up to 16 cameras mounted inside or outside of this home and view all 16 at the same time. So really every room in this house? Virtually everything in this house could be viewed by a camera. If we're not where we can be watching this at while it's going on, can we record any of this? Yes, we can. As a matter of fact, you'll notice in the upper right part of the screen, 
there's a push button for record. It records onto the hard drive of this PC. The real idea behind this technology is the ability to call the system remotely and look into your home. You can make this connection from work or anywhere in the world if you have a telephone. All you need is a PC, the software, and a modem. And unlike many of its internet counterparts, this system is very secure. You must have the correct phone number and password to get into the system and see inside your home. Protecting your home and more importantly your family has always been important and the next generation of security systems does it better than ever. If you'd like more information about finding the right security system for your home, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. You don't have to be an expert to tile a bathroom floor. With a little ambition and patience you can do it yourself. Super handyman Al Carroll lays it all out. Then, Joe Sharinsky shows you how to turn those leftover bathroom tiles into mosaic stepping stones that will add a touch of style to the outdoor walkway of your new house. If you'd like a detailed list of the tools and materials needed for any project that you've seen on the show, you can find it on the internet at www.michaelholligan.com. You know, maybe it's the mean little kid in me, but I sort of enjoy taking perfectly good carpet and ripping it up and getting it out of the way. The reason we're doing this is because in a bathroom, carpet really doesn't make a lot of sense. It picks up a lot of moisture, holds the moisture, becomes mildewy, and so it's not a really very good surface. What we're going to do is replace the carpet with some tiles. Ceramic tile is the fastest growing flooring material in the country these days, and for good reason. We're going to show you how easy it is for a do-it-yourselfer to install this stuff. First though, we've got to get the floor taken care of, and that means getting rid of the tack strips all the way around. That's a pretty easy but tedious thing to do. Now if you're going to be crawling around on a concrete floor, it's a good idea to wear some knee pads. They don't cost a lot and they'll sure save your knees. Now that we've got all the tack strips up and we've swept up the debris, it's time for us to go around and cut off the door jams. What we'd like to do is to be able to put the tile so it slides in under there and as you can see it's a little too narrow. So we're going to put this piece of tile down there as a base and we're going to take this cutoff saw and go to work at cutting off the jam. Well I believe that's got it. Let me get this little chunk out of here and see if this is going to fit in under there. Oops, I know what's happened. There's a two before in here, and we're not going to be able to cut that out very easily, but we can notch out the piece of tile so that it'll fit. And what we'll need to do is to notch it out so that it'll fit all the way under, and our grout line is going to be right here under the door, and that's desirable. Then next, let's slide this piece in place. We'll have to leave a little space there. Now we have a piece over here that we're going to have to cut so that it's going to fit. But then we'll follow this entryway all the way out to the pattern that we have. This is the one that the homeowner picked out. Once we get this established, I think the rest of it is going to go together just like a jigsaw puzzle. I guess right now we better mark where we're going to cut out here and then get on out to the wet saw and take care of this part of it. Now this is a wet saw and for our project we've got a lot of cutting to do so it's a good idea to have this. We have rented it and you can rent one at a home center or one of the rental places. If you have a smaller job then you can probably get by with other ways to cut the tile. But for our purpose this is the one I wanted to use. Now comes the fun part, putting our jigsaw puzzle together. The first thing we're going to do is use this notch piece here and see if it fits the way it's supposed to. Looks to me like it's going to slide right in place. Sometimes you may need to use the rubber end of the hammer handle to get it down there, but that is good. Now let's see what else we can do. Hey, that's beginning to look really good, isn't it? Okay, now the next thing we need to do is to strike a center line going right down here so that we can work on this half and then come back up working on the other half. And in order to do that, we want to snap a chalk line. 
Now I've already measured over from the cabinets and I've got a place down here where we can hook up the chalk line and run it all the way back to the entrance back there. Now all we have to do is run it down here. We've got a line marked out the same distance right here. Hold it down real tight and flat. And there we have our working chalk line. And now we need to mix up our adhesive, which is called Thin Set. Now there are two things you want to remember. One is to mix slow, and the other one is to work fast. And the reason we're going to mix slow is we don't want to create any air pockets in the Thin Set. And the reason we work fast is this stuff dries really quickly. So we might as well just get started right now. And we'll start over here at the beginning, which is a good place to start. And what we're going to be using is a notched trowel. And the reason for that is you get much better adhesion when you're able to leave these little gaps in here. Now when you put this first one in place here, you want to push down on it so that it's even all the way around. And for this one over here, I'm just going to butter the back of it. And remember, we're working from this center line right here, going all the way across the length of the bathroom. Now even after you get the tile down, you have a little bit of time to move it around a little bit to be sure it lines up. Well, as you can see, we've made pretty good progress. I want to remind you, though, when you're going to have to cut pieces off to go up against the wall up here, be sure you subtract a quarter inch so that you're going to end up with a good size grout joint. Now this little tool that I'm using is called a grout saw, and what we're doing is we're removing most of the stuff that was squeezed out when we put the tiles in place. We have to do that so that we'll have room for our grout. It looks like we've made a mess in here, but actually most of this is just dust that I've taken out of these cracks. When we get through with this, we'll vacuum all that up. Well, the vacuum got most of it, but as you can see, it didn't get it all, but the sponge is going to get the rest of it. When we get through sponging and get it all clean and dry, we can start our grouting. And that's the most exciting thing because it's actually the finishing touch. Now we're applying the grout. It's sort of a fun thing to do. A lot of people wonder about all of this that slops over on the side that doesn't go into the grout joints. Don't worry about that. It comes in powder form. You add water to mix it. We got the kind that is going to match almost perfectly the color of the tile. I think that's going to give us a real good look when it's all over with. Well, this is our final sponging, which means we're through. And it really does look great. And remember, it's a do-it-yourself project. One thing I want to remind you of though, you should put a sealer on here to protect the grout. You want to wait about four to six days now before you put the sealer on there so it's completely dry. If you have questions about this, why don't you contact us on the internet? It's michaelholligan.com. A perfectly good ceramic floor tile. And here's a great way to break it. Cover it with a towel so that you don't have shards flying around. And smack it with a hammer. Why would we want to break a perfectly good floor tile? Because what I want to do today is show you how to make your own decorative stepping stones for your landscape out of an ordinary concrete stepping stone and some broken floor tiles. Ceramic floor tiles come in different thicknesses, and you should try to work with one thickness of tile. It'll make assembling it and putting it all together much simpler. Also, remember that the surface of each one of these pieces has to be about the same. You're going to be walking on this later, and it saves a lot of time and effort if the stones are all the same thickness to begin with. And once you've got your pattern laid out, it's time to start making a thin set mortar mix. It's actually called that, thin set mortar. And we want to make it the consistency of something like runny peanut butter, a little too soft. And we want to trowel an even quarter to one half inch layer of that onto the stepping stone we're going to be working with. That stone, by the way, should be pre-moistened. Soak it in a bucket of water or something for a couple of hours before proceeding to this step. 
The thin set mortar mix is a dry powder. And we want to mix enough that we get that just right consistency. Once we've got it mixed to about the right consistency, we want to trowel it onto our pre-moistened stepping stone. And this is something like icing a cake, a thing that I frankly have never done. But I've seen it done plenty of times, and I've certainly enjoyed the results. We want to get a nice even layer, about a quarter to a half inch thick, over the entire surface of the stepping stone. Now once we've got a sufficient amount of the mortar on there and kind of spread out with our ordinary trowel, we go to using what's called a notched trowel. And this will help us spread it out in an even thickness over the entire stone. Now once we've spread the thin set mortar mix out into an even layer, it's time to transfer our pattern to the mortar mix and do it one stone at a time. And again, I'm going to start with the one in the middle. Now it's important when you're putting in the stones that each one is approximately the same height. And a good way to do that is to take anything that's flat and smooth, I'm using a torpedo level, and smooth out and press into place each stone so that the surface of each one is about the same height. Now once we've transferred the tiles and approximately leveled them up, we have to wait 24 to 48 hours for the mortar mix to harden. I have another stone that I put together 48 hours ago so that I can show you the next step. Lay out some newspaper to catch any grout that you mix. Now we've mixed up our grout. Grout won't stick to the smooth surface of the tiles, and it comes in a variety of colors. And since this particular stepping stone has a good deal of white tile in it, I wanted a gray grout. And I'm going to put that right on top of the stones and squeeze it down in between the joints of the stones. Get it as even as you can. And after you've filled all the joints, we're going to do the sides of the stepping stone as well, so that we don't see that original brown color of our stepping stone. Once you've covered the entire stepping stone with grout, take a moist sponge and smooth off the edges. And after about 45 minutes or so, you'll be able to clean the grout off the individual tiles, reveal their true and bright colors. Making these is simple. And in fact, making these stepping stones is a fun family activity. Kids really get a kick out of seeing their own artwork right out there in the great outdoors. Finding a way to reach those deep corners when you're caulking can be quite a trick. But here's a quick tip for you. The nozzle on your caulking tube may be too short to reach into those deep corners and narrow spaces, but you can extend the length of it by using an ordinary plastic drinking straw. Just place it over the tip of your nozzle and then take some ordinary duct tape to secure it. Now you're ready to start caulking those corners and crevices. You probably want to hold the straw with one hand to help guide it and then squeeze the trigger of your caulking gun with the other hand. That way you're sure to get a nice caulking bead. You can cut the length of this straw if you need it a little bit shorter for your job. And if you have a really hard to reach area, you can use a flexible straw, one that bends like this because that can actually reach around the corner. And if your straw is too small in diameter, just take a utility knife and cut a little slit in the end. Then again, just place it over the nozzle and secure it with a little duct tape. I have one more tip for you. If you warm your tube of caulk before you begin, you'll find that it passes much easier through the straw. It begins life as cold rolled steel, but after it's stamped, sprayed, and baked, it's ready to come to your new house where it'll really heat things up when we return. Did you know that your kitchen range probably started out as a giant wheel of cold rolled steel? 
Here at this Whirlpool Electric Range Factory in Tulsa, Oklahoma, huge semi-trailers carrying rolls of steel arrive about every 20 minutes. Each roll weighs thousands of pounds, and they come in different widths depending upon which part of the range they're making from them. The rolls are placed on giant feeder wheels, and the oven making process begins. The steel is first fed into a stamping machine. Different machines stamp out different parts of the range. This machine is making oven trays. The steel is cut, then sent to the first press, which creates the cavity. At the next stop, another press puts curves on the edges of the tray. The 600-ton press is turning out perfectly formed trays from steel that had been sitting on a truck just a little while ago. Thousands of trays a day just keep coming and coming. On another production line, another roll of steel is being cut into longer sections. The sheets are turned around, fed into the press, and molded into a familiar looking form that will become the oven cavity. The whole process is automated and controlled by computer. The back is attached and the oven cavities join other components that have been molded by other presses, ready for the next step in the process. A high pressure soapy water spray is used to wash off the lubrication that's found on all cold roll steel. What it does is wash off the oily film, then rinse off the material, and then apply a phosphate that's because after this step, we're gonna spray a porcelain coating onto it. When the range tops and other parts come out, they're ready for the application of the porcelain finish. The parts are sprayed with an enamel base coat that's specially made to bond to steel. Then an electrically charged cover coat of white or almond powdered porcelain enamel is sprayed on. The electric charge makes the porcelain stick to the base for an even coat. The use of electrically charged powders layered in multiple coats saves a huge amount of time. Before this technology, the base coat had to be applied, then fired, and then the color coat was applied and fired. This system allows two coats to be applied with only one firing. The process is controlled by a panel of instruments that precisely regulates the amount of electrical charge and controls the flow rate of the powder. Now the only thing holding that porcelain powder on right now is static electricity. Now it goes in the kiln where it's fired up at 1500 degrees and that'll seal it on there permanently. Minutes later, the range tops come out with super strong baked on porcelain glaze that will hold up for years. Meanwhile, the oven cavity has been coated with heat resistant enamel. In the self clean cycle, temperatures in the oven can reach 700 degrees. This blanket of insulation provides an added layer of safety and energy efficiency. As the ranges move down the production line, side brackets are attached and legs are put on. The sides are put on, the control panel is attached, and the porcelain fired range top is put on. The components in the range top are attached one by one. The electrical lines are run for the heating elements. The heating elements are attached as the unit moves down the line, looking more like an electric range at every stop. Now it's time for the finishing touches. The oven trays are put in, the storage drawer slides in, the oven door goes on, there's a final check to be sure all the electrical systems are working, and all that's left to do is box it up, pack it, and send it down the line, maybe headed for the kitchen in your new house. In today's Mortgage Moment, I'll show you a government program that will help pay for any remodeling or repairs around your house plus a perfect project for the kid and you. Your very own miniature train running along the walls of your new house. Teresa Garrett gets you on track. And a wall doesn't have to be just a wall. Today we're gonna to show you some great textures that you can do to any wall in your home when your new house returns. If you'd like a detailed list of the tools and materials needed for any project that you've seen on the show, you can find it on the internet at www.michaelholligan.com. If you've got your eye on a home that's seen better days but could be turned into a real gym with some rehab and repair work, you should know about HUD's 203K program. The 203K has been around since 1961 but has only recently caught on with lenders and home buyers thanks to changes that made it quicker and easier to use. The 203K program is essentially a hybrid construction to permanent loan. It allows you to finance the purchase of the property and the repair work through the same loan. The loan can be for 110% of the expected market value of the completed home with as little as 3% down. 
the money for the repair work is held in escrow and dispersed as the construction progresses. You qualify for the 203k loan as you would any other FHA insured home loan. The difference is you also work with a HUD trained rehabilitation consultant who will look at the property to determine the work that needs to be done, how long it will take, and how much it will increase the value of the home. You have to have at least $5,000 worth of eligible repair work, but the list of eligible repairs is extensive. Under the 203k program, you could make structural alterations, repair termite damage, remodel bathrooms and kitchens, and add new siding, flooring, and roofing, just to name a few eligible repairs. You could even buy a home and move it to another piece of land, then renovate it. You have up to six months to complete the work on the home. As with any restricted mortgage, there are associated costs. HUD insures 203k program mortgages and charges you one half of 1% of the loan amount to do so. Also, the rates on 203Ks usually run about a percentage point higher because lenders view them as riskier and there are other fees for an independent consultant, a plan review, appraisals, and inspections. Some people have a gift for seeing the potential beauty in a rundown or outdated home. If you're one of them, HUD's 203K program could be your way to give new life to a home that's seen better days. sets have been popular for a long time, but they're not just for kids. A lot of adults collect trains. The only problem is there's a lot of track laying around the house, and if you have company coming over, or maybe you're through playing with the train, you have to pick all that track up. So today, we're going to be putting the train track up on the wall. Now you've probably seen this a lot in stores and even in restaurants. What about your house? This is a very fun project, so let's get started. The first thing that we want to do is take some measurements for our corner shelf. Now this is where our train is going to make its turn right here in the corner, so we want our shelves to be sturdy. We're going to take some brackets and mount them to the wall, and the best place to mount them is in a stud. So let me just see if I can find that again. Okay, there it is right there, and I need to find one over here. Okay, good. Now what I need to do is take some measurements so I'll know how wide to make my shelf, and that's 24 inches there, 24 inches there. All right, I've got all the measurements now for my corner shelves. Hey, Roger. Hi, how's it going? It's going great. This is Roger, and he's a train enthusiast, so he's real excited that we're putting this in his house. You want to help me? All right. Okay, why don't you help me take some measurements? Okay, I see your mark here. All right, we're taking measurements for our wall shelf, and this is going to connect to our corner shelf. So this is 65. Roger, you want to write this down? Okay. 65 inches. Right. Wall, wall shelf. shelf. Uh, what was the corner shelf? Oh, the corner shelves were 24 by 24. Okay. 24 by 24. Right. Roger, we got our measurements. Let's go get some lumber. And what we want to work on first is our corner shelves. Now these are the shelves that the train will actually make its turn in the corners. So let me go ahead and mark this. What's our first 24 inches? 24 inches on both sides. Drop the pencil. Okay, so I'll mark that right there at 24. Now this side is already 24 inches, so I need to mark where the next shelf is going to come off. And it's five and a half five inches and wide. Half. Let me mark that right there. I'm going to use a square just to give myself a straight line. Here, you want to get that one? Now the reason that I marked this at five and a half inches is because this, this piece right here fits in the corner and then this runs down the wall and that next shelf will run off of this piece right here. Now what we want to do is determine the radius for our track. So the easiest way to do this, we can take this track and set it right on our five and a half inch marks that we made. Now Roger, if you'll hold okay. that for me, all I have to do now is just trace around this track and this will show us exactly where we need to cut this shelf out. Just like that. All right, one more cut. And cut this side right here. And there you go, there's our corner shelf. Roger, let's just go ahead and slide this one back down. And what we can do, since we have three more corner shelves to cut, is just use this first one as a template. So let me just line this up there and then just trace around this and we're good to go. All right, now that we have our four corner shelves cut, we're ready to work on the wall shelves. Roger, what's our measurement on those again? 
see, we need two at 82 and two at 65. Okay. Let's cut the 82 okay. first. There, you got that? Put a mark here. And again, I'll use my square just to give myself a straight line. Okay. We can use a saber saw again for the rest of our cut. Excuse me there, Roger. Now that we have all of our shelving cut out, we're going to go ahead and paint this out here in the garage to avoid any mess on the inside. And we've already pre-painted our brackets. So while we let this dry, in the meantime, we'll go back into the house and hang up the brackets. We need to put a wall shelf above this window so that our train can run on this wall. So let me take a measurement from the top of the window to the crown molding. That's seven and a half inches. Now our wall shelves are three quarter inch thick, so if we deduct the three quarters from our measurement, that gives us six and three quarter inches. Okay. Roger, if you'll mark this corner for us, we can get going on this. Okay, now if you'll use the level, Roger's gonna come down to our six and three quarter inch mark and then draw us a straight line across, and that's where the top of our shelf is going to be. We're ready to hang our brackets, so what we need to do is measure down from this line, which is going to be the top of our shelf, remember, down three quarters of an inch because that's how thick our shelf is. But I need to add that three quarters of an inch to this measurement, which is an inch and a half. This is where my screw is going to be right there. So that puts me at two and a quarter inches. So let me just mark that right there, two and a quarter. Okay, now I'm put my screw in. Now you'll notice that I left this sticking out a quarter of an inch. Let me show you how this bracket hangs. This slides down over the screw just like that, and that's how it hangs from the wall. Let me go ahead and line that up. Okay, push this bracket down and then give it a couple of taps down like that, and that tightens the bracket in place. Okay, now that our corner brackets are in place, we can hang this corner shelf, and we've attached an L bracket to the top of the shelf, and that's going to keep the back of the shelf from falling down. Okay, you got that up there? You want to make sure it's level before you screw that in? And Roger's screwing that bracket into the stud so it'll hold our shelf securely in place. Now we're putting our track on the shelf, and I'm using a half inch screw to attach this. And this just goes right through the track here. Screw that in. Okay, now we can set this up on the brackets. What I want to do up here is put this side on first, just like that. And then down here, I have to lift this corner shelf up so I can line these up together and I can set them down in place. I need to use a screw now to screw this into the bracket. Roger, this looks really nice. What we're doing is we're adding a piece of trim around our shelves, and that's to cover up the unfinished edge. Now we could just paint this, but we also want to cover up our seams where our two boards meet. So we'll just put this trim on here. That's going to give it a really nice finished look. Let me put a nail right in here, Teresa, and then we'll work down towards your end. Okay, I'll hold this. Get straight? Yeah. Okay, and we're using finishing nails to attach this. I'm just going right here in the center. Okay, Roger, our transformers are hooked up and our trains are in place. Let's see how they work. I want to go first. Okay, be my guest. Mine's working great. They both are. This is really cool. Now Roger can come in here and enjoy his train set anytime he wants. We spent $250 on our project, and it took us most of the day. Also, it was handy having an extra pair of hands. If you would like more information on this project or others, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com.
This is a standard dryer vent hose. This is made out of vinyl wrapped around a continuous spiral wire. This works okay, but it has a couple of disadvantages. One, one end has to go to the outside vent, one end behind the dryer, so you need about this much room behind your dryer. And if you're working with a small laundry room like this one, that's not good. Another disadvantage is this accordion stuff going on here. This collects a lot of lint. Then you end up with something like this. A lot of lint can affect the performance of your dryer and too much lint can actually be a fire hazard. This is probably one step better because it doesn't collect near as much lint because the surface inside of it is smoother. But this will take up more room. It'll bend any direction you need it to, but like I said, take up more room, that's not good. So here's a quick tip for you. For about $20, you can get one of these periscope dryer bins. One end goes to the outside vent, one end behind the dryer, and you only need about two and a half inches behind your dryer. So you can scoot that dryer back up against the wall, and that's a good thing. Another advantage with this is it has a very smooth surface inside, so it's not gonna collect hardly any lint at all. Now you can also pull this out and you can buy these in longer lengths. The good thing about that is if your outside vent is here and you want to place your dryer somewhere else, you can just extend this across the length of your wall. Next, see how simple glazing and texturing techniques can jazz up the walls of your new house. Michael helps you go from flat to fantastic when we come back. And this is one of our more popular interior finishes. Gray? Well, we like to call it dark white. That color looks just like unpainted drywall. All right, you got me. It is unpainted drywall. So what do we do about all those screw holes and tape lines? Well, I'm no interior decorator, but uh, you're going to hang pictures, right? This is the part of the construction phase where you really get excited about your home because now the drywall's up, it's tape embedded. You're finally figuring out what the home's going to feel like as far as room dimensions, ceiling heights, where everything's going to be good time, but a time to make another decision, and that's the texture that's actually going to go on our walls now that they're tape embedded. There's a lot of textures to choose from, and once you put that paint on top of it, it's going to be very expensive to take that texture off and change it, so we need to pick up front. Our first texture here is very easy to put on. It's called orange peel. It's really just sprayed right onto the wall. The reason they call it orange peel is because that's exactly what it looks and feels like, just like an ordinary orange. Next to it, we have a texture that you apply the same way. You spray it on with your gun, but then they actually drag a trowel across the top of it very lightly and just knock the top edges off of it. It's called a splatter drag. So you can see it's a very different look. Instead of all those little dots, now we have some big sections here. And it's great if you're using some different color paints because it really brings out the highlights between the tops that are smooth and these little valleys in between. This next texture is called a sponge, and that's exactly what it looks like. You went in real tight with a sponge and then try to pull the texture off the wall. So it very intricate pattern, a lot of details. It never repeats itself, a lot of points on it sharp. If you use different color paints, trying different faux techniques, this might be the choice for you. Next to it, we have what's called hand trowel. You can see it almost looks like a stucco exterior on a home. They just took a hand trowel on a lot of mud, started moving it around there. Again, a varied technique. It doesn't look the same in any one place. Very much like a fresco almost. So if you wanted an aged look on your wall, you could put this up there and then maybe chip away a little bit of it even. Paint it a lot of different colors or antique the wall. But again, a lot of different looks are possible. Now when you get a wall hand troweled, it is going to cost extra because you've got to put a lot of texture on there and actually do a lot of physical labor. But you can see when you put the different color paints on it and some glaze and give it an antique finish, it really looks nice. Prices vary across the country on different types of textures. Some places where I build, it costs extra to have the wall textured perfectly smooth. Other places, it is a standard and it costs more to have a splatter drag like this. It just depends on where you live and what the labor force is used to in your area. But pick out the texture that you want before you paint those walls because after you move in, it's going to be a major hassle and a lot of expense to come back in, sand down walls, retexture them, and put on paint without getting a mess on everything. If you have any questions at all about home building, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com.
Today we're going to be checking out some products that are all designed to make your life a little bit easier. And the first one is right here in my backpack and it's called the Airman. And what it is, is a portable, rechargeable, electric air pump. As opposed to a traditional air pump that you have to sit there and go like this with your back and it kind of kills you and you have to carry it around, this is much easier. Just push a button and you can fill up your bicycle tires with air or a volleyball or even your car tires. It's lightweight, easy to carry around. It plugs into an AC outlet to charge up. It's got a little storage area right here where it has a bunch of different adapters for a volleyball or a soccer ball or whatever. The cost of the Airman is about $50 and it's from Sharper Image. Now we all know what a hassle it is to control mini blinds. You have to bend over and turn that wand. It's a really tough job. But now it's a job you don't have to worry about because of SmartHome.com's Auto Tilt. It's a remote control that controls a motor that's hooked up to the mini blinds wand. Once you have it all hooked up, all you do is step back, push a button, and you can close the mini blinds just like that. Push the button again, and you can open the mini blinds pretty neat. Now one remote can control six of those motors and the cost about $70. And compared to bending over and doing it yourself, this is certainly a shade better. Now what could be more annoying than a CD that skips? Well one way to solve that problem is skip doctor to the rescue. That's what this is right over here. The way the skip doctor works, you just open it up just like that. You take your CD that has a problem and you spray it with the solution that's provided. We did that already. You close this down, it snaps in like that, and you turn this crank and it slowly buffs out the nick or scratch or fingerprint so your CD works just fine. Now the cost of the skip doctor is about $35. You can find it in the solutions catalog and it should put you right back on track. Now this may look like a high-powered weapon, but actually it's a high-powered spray gun. It's the Tornado Superjet. You just hook it up to your garden hose, push the trigger right here and stand back, and it's great for washing down your car. One of the nice features, it has this soap compartment right here, so if you add some car soap right there, you can switch between washing up your car and soaping up your car by just flipping the switch, just like that. Also, there are several different nozzle choices. By just flipping the switch like that, you can now rinse your car down, you can even mist your backyard plants with this setting. Now the cost of the Tornado Superjet is about $30 and it's from Brookstone and this is great for cleaning your car. But for cleaning your driveway, check this out. Now one of those jobs that's just not a lot of fun is cleaning off the driveway or the patio. But one way to make it a little bit easier is with this product right here. It's called the water broom. You hook it up to your garden hose and when you turn this lever like this, it pressure cleans the driveway or patio. If you want to increase the pressure, you tip it forward like this. If you want to clean a larger area, just tip it back and you move it back and forth in a zigzag pattern and it sprays down the driveway or patio. Now you can find this product in the Sporties catalog and it costs about $150. Now if you hate going to the dry cleaner so often, this might be one way to go. This is the Ionic Dry Cleaner. And the way it works, it uses Ionic technology to neutralize smells and odors. You can either hang it up on the clothes bar or attach it to the wall or sit it on a shelf. It's got several different settings. Low is for normal use, high is if you have some really smelly clothes. And if you've got a real bad problem, there's this burst which eliminates odors in a shorter period of time. Now the cost of the Ionic Dry Cleaner is about $90 and it's by Sharper Image. And finally, what could be more frustrating than wanting some ice cream and it's rock hard and you can't get to it? Well, check this out. This is called Hot Scoop. And what it is is an ice cream scoop you put inside the microwave for about 30 seconds. The handle stays nice and cool, but the scoop part gets nice and hot. So now you can dig into that ice cream very easily, take out a nice scoop of it, just like that, and you're set. It's dishwasher safe costs about $15 and you can find it in the improvements catalog. And I don't know about you, some things are worth waiting for, but when it comes to ice cream, I can't wait. Now for more information on this product or any of the other Check This Out products, check out our website at michaelholligan.com.